Good morning. Thank you for joining Armina McKenna for today's webinar, ERP Solution Selection Best Practices, the three most important things you need to know. My name is Mary Tressel, and I'm here today with Tim Horgan, our presenter. First, I'd like to explain to you how to use your webinar pane. Please note that the orange arrow will allow you to minimize or maximize the pane. If it is minimized, simply click on the orange arrow to bring it back. Feel free to submit any questions that you have for Tim throughout the duration of the webinar. He will handle the questions at the end of the webinar as time permits. If we run out of time, Tim um, has offered to send an email response to you with an answer for your question. Next, we'll show you how to modify your audio settings. If you are using your telephone to listen into our webinar, please make sure you select the Use Telephone button. If you're listening through your computer speakers, please select Use Mic and Speakers. If you have the incorrect settings selected, it will produce an echo sound. And now I'd like to introduce to you Tim Horrigan, our ERP consulting partner. Tim is an ERP sales, planning, and implementation expert with more than 20 years of business and systems integration consulting experience. He's worked with high growth startup, mid-market, and enterprise, public, private, and FDA regulated companies in the life sciences, high tech, and business services industries. Prior to joining Armenino, Tim was a consulting partner at Accenture. His consulting expertise spans both domestic and international sales and delivery leading teams of four to 75 consultants on services projects lasting three weeks to up to two years. Tim also has a proven solution delivery track record with more than $25 million in revenue supervised. Tim's client work includes extensive IT, business architecture design, software selection, and ERP planning for CRM, SCM, production, and financial management functions. Tim is also a frequent writer, speaker, and author on ERP implementation topics, and he's actually written two ebooks on the ERP selection and implementation process. So with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Tim Horrigan. Thank you, Mary. Hello and welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to talk to you today, and I will be sharing with you the three most important things you need to know about selecting your new ERP solution. Number one, understanding the rules of the game. Number two, preparing your game plan. And number three, how the ERP vendors you'll be working with will expect to, to uh, play their game plan. Over the next 45 minutes, I'm going to give you uh, some, a comprehensive framework on what to do and how to do it. Uh, we won't be able to drive into every detail, but you'll certainly be well prepared to start your own ERP game plan. And uh, I'm certainly not going to waste your time, so I hope you spend it with me. Next up, just to, to highlight, the goal of our presentation today is really to make you a more informed ERP buyer. Quite frankly, it's a win-win. You're going to be more successful, and I think the better questions and more prepared you are to ask questions of vendors, including Armanino in the sales cycle, the more likely Armanino is to do business with you. So as we think about ERP, just to give us a mental model, I'd like to take you through the three paradigms that I think have applied uh, over the past few years, uh, just, just to, uh, to shape what our conversation today. So the first is, when you think about ERP projects back in the 90s, I think they really had a uh, infrastructure focus, right? The, the mental model was around, hey, we're going to be building a new plumbing system, heating and cooling system, the framing of the building, lots of capability, but not necessarily as polished or easy to use as systems are today. Similarly, in the last decade, I think if you were shopping for an ERP, this might sound more familiar to you, you'd get a lot of analogies or articles written around how uh, ERP projects are like redesigning a 747 mid-flight, uh, training the pilots uh, to land and hopefully landing safely, which they sometimes did and sometimes did not. And that's probably true today as well. But I think for today, the best analogy to use and to think about for your ERP project is really that ERP is a team sport. Uh, it's a sport that is really uh, made, up, made up of players that are both veterans, typically, and a lot of rookies. Uh, it's a sport that really is not played uh, more than once every three to five years. So quite frankly, 
uh, people aren't real good at it um, for the folks who are just doing it um, for the first time. Um, how well that team plays together will really drive how successful your project will be. And you'll hear me talk a lot about that today in terms of emphasizing the importance of the people component of the project itself. Let me also give you some, some perspective on what I think ERP projects are not. Um, ERP projects are not candidates as do-it-yourself projects. Um, for the same reasons that most of those uh, well-intentioned home improvement projects uh, start off think it being a good idea, ultimately take much longer, uh, cost more than you think, and create a stress level that you didn't anticipate. Uh, you know, case in point, uh, if you, like me, have the home improvement, uh, you know, workbook from Home Depot, even in there it'll say that, hey, a beginner will take uh, two to three times longer than an experienced person to implement whatever your favorite improvement project is. And I think the same is true for ERP projects. So it pays to get some help. Next up, I'd say that ERP projects are not simply service or product technology decisions. Um, whether you look for an on-premise solution or a cloud solution, simply giving your users access to a new solution or a new technology will not spontaneously deliver the user adoption and the business results that you're looking for. ERP projects are not done in a back room. Uh, there is, as much as you might like, uh, someone to do it all for you, or as much as a, your favorite salesperson might say to you, I can do it all for you. Um, it is simply not uh, a matter of taking your order, whether you want fries or best practices with that, for your favorite consultant to go away up on the mountain and perform a miracle to configure the system, and then serve it back to you on a silver platter, uh, is simply not representative of the actual process. ERP projects are very collaborative and collaborative at each stage of the process. In fact, a good rule of thumb is to think about staffing folks from your organization on the project from 20 to 40 percent of the time for each week of the project. It's not a matter of they will be involved in the front and then there'll be this lull and then they'll come back and, and get trained at the end. Today's ERP projects, as I said, are very collaborative, and we'll go into the reasons why. Looking at the profile for a typical project today versus, say, five or ten years ago, these are some of the key characteristics. First off, as you've already heard me say, I would characterize them as much more partnership-driven than technology-driven. Uh, in the past, I would say that ERP projects were much more about what programming language your consultant knows and is and how fast they can code versus today um, how well does your ERP consultant know the easily or more easily configurable aspects of the solution of which for a typical leading solution there'll be 3,000 uh, or more windows menus features that need they need to be familiar with so the skill set has really changed from that highly technology driven not to say that it's not relevant but the, the vast majority being the focus of really a knowledge transfer exercise. How well, how effectively can I train your people on the new capabilities of my favorite solution? In the past, there's much more custom development involved, and there still can be in some cases for your, for your even current ERP solutions, and that is still true that what programming language it is and those kinds of things are still relevant. But, in a, it, but it is a far smaller component of any project than it was even five or ten years ago. Today, most pro projects uh, are really commercial off-the-shelf type solutions. Uh, they would take months rather than years. Uh, they'd be performed both on-site and remote. And more, really more of a part-time activity, more than anything else, gated by access to your users rather than in the past where you might back up the bus and bring out the consultants, and uh, they would really be on site full time because they needed to be. There was that much programming that needed to be done. Today, it's, it's much, much different. And really, as I said, it's really about how much time can I spend with your users, and most users simply don't already have a, a uh, full-time job, so they simply don't have the bandwidth to spend 
more than one or two days with me. Similarly, in the past, the vendor hours were far, far greater than the total client hours, where I'd say that's shifted again in today's environment, simply because typically there's a lot more users or stakeholders uh, and fewer consultants, but also the percentage of the work is shared between both the client and the vendor, again, because it's people-driven. It's their participation required in the training and the requirements gathering relative to the quite uh, diminished amount of new development required versus the old days. Consequently, 10 times the development in the past, probably 10 times the cost in the past, not to say that ERP is any, any kind of an inexpensive activity, but it is a far lower cost um, activity than in the past. More characteristics around ERP are, as I like to say, they're multi-everything. People, process, technology, multifunction, multi-department, company, currency, whatever you can think of, there's a lot going on. So it's, it's important to approach it that way that, it, again, it's simply not an IT project. Likewise, when we break down that people, process, and technology component, you can see from these chevrons that there's several activities that are all going on in parallel, be it more from a documentation or process standpoint to in parallel to the technology components to also an overriding, again, knowledge transfer, change management type activity. ERP projects also automate end-to-end -end business processes. And this is actually an exciting area of any project, and I would encourage you never to miss these meetings, which will come early in the project, simply because you are bringing together people that quite often do not interact as often or as frequently as maybe they should. And so consequently, some sparks do fly when you start getting the sales team talking to the sales operations team, and the sales operations team talking to the shipping team, and then the accounts receivable uh, team coming in and talking to the, the sales operations team. Those end-to-end -end connections are also the greatest opportunity for value add in any project, but bringing those, those clients together uh, is also a, a, an activity that needs to be uh, well-managed uh, to make sure everybody stays a good corporate citizen. So they're a lot of fun. Next up, I would also highlight that any ERP decision you make, be it cloud, be it on-premise, is a very, very important platform decision uh, for your company. Um, ERP would fit into that business applications bubble in the center. It would be one element of that. But your choice of ERP solution certainly influences a wide variety of other technology choices that you'll have, uh, be it you know, in the case of Microsoft. If you embrace the Microsoft stack, you're, you're looking at Outlook. You're looking at Link for unified communications. You're looking at SQL Server for your database and a whole host of other solutions. Alternatively, you could be in a Unix environment. You could be embracing a, an Oracle database. Uh, so it's important to, keep, you know, to be aware that when you're shopping for a new ERP, uh, not to just make an on-the-fly decision as part of the procurement process, but to rather uh, put some careful thought into it in advance to know, is the solution I'm looking at aligned with my overall IT plan? Next up, we're looking at a function diagram of the various uh, components of an end-to-end -end, uh, ERP solution. So the boxes that are shaded, I would argue, would all be um, the types of capability that a leading ERP solution would enable and be pre-integrated. So there's, there's the value add. Uh, the white boxes would be more traditionally point solutions that would be interfaces back to your favorite ERP solution. That said, there is a multitude of choices uh, where other point solutions could replace individual boxes in the shaded region. So the key point being you have a lot of flexibility and pros and cons for each. And again, one more good reason to think through um, what is your overall vision around the, the functionality that you're trying to integrate. Another important choice on your ERP path is what your favorite deployment model will be. And this, begs some, or the, this topic always begs definition because I would say as an observation that vendors all choose to define these different categories a little bit differently to their advantage. Uh, but, but arguably, they break into the uh, traditional on-premise perpetual license model, uh, the private cloud, or AKA the hosted model for someone uh, hosting your perpetual license, 
And then cloud and SaaS really are around subscription-based offerings and SaaS being a true multi-tenant type offering. The difference is also being uh, on the far right, generally speaking, would, would typically be cheaper because of that economy of scale, or at least has the opportunity to be. And to the left would, would allow you to have more control over your business. Um, in the middle, it, it's, it's really up for debate as to what are the areas that are most important to you. But my counsel would simply be, you know, think through them all, consider them, what's most important for your business. Next up, I wanted to highlight a sample work plan. In this case, this is an illustrative seven-month work plan for a mythical, typical, mid-market client. Um, there certainly is ERP projects that I've worked on that go much faster, and there's certainly ERP projects that have gone much longer. Uh, the key point of this is there is a lot going on and a lot of steps. Um, if I were to blow this out um, and add in the resources to it, both client and um, uh, consultant, I could easily have a work, be looking at a work plan that's up to a thousand rows. So there's a lot to think about, and what's important in your uh, evaluation process is that you just get clear about what are the steps that are included and what are the steps that are not included, and just as important, who's going to perform each step. Aligned with that work plan are critical path items. And there's really two points I wanted to highlight on this slide. One is, for sure, the amount of new customization and development will drive the length of your project. That is most definitely one of the key critical path line items. The other is simply just the, the recognition as you take in each of these points that many, if not all, are really driven by the client. So there's a lot of dependency on the client getting to end user training, the client helping to validate the UAT scripts, uh, simply scheduling meetings with the clients, um, all those good things. So it's, just, it's important, again, that it's the vision of your ERP project to make it successful is not that your vendor is going to magically be able to do everything on their own. They're going to need to collaborate with you to a great degree. Next up, I wanted to mention a couple things on data conversion, because this is another key area to consider. Uh, first off is just the observation that most typically we would um, migrate really summary level information and only transaction level information that is, that is current, so the, op or the current month open balances. Uh, but any history is typically left in your legacy ERP system. What often then comes up is Sometimes clients, or to, to varying degrees, have a, a need for true trending reports beyond just, say, the uh, monthly balance history of, of their um, GL system, but for other sales data and important data to them. And that's what I wanted to highlight here is just that that can call or call out the need for a data warehouse type solution. doesn't mean you have to have a data warehouse, but you'll need some way of merging your reports across multiple data sources, and that's a key um, discussion point to, to think through when you're looking at your overall solution. Next up, for those who aren't already familiar with SOX, just a, a few points. SOX, of course, is focused on the reliability of your financial reporting. Um, it's a legal requirement for public companies. It's a recommended um, activity for all companies, just as a good uh, governance risk compliance type practice. Um, Important to note is while the government has specified that thou shalt do certain things, they don't dictate how those things are done. Uh, that generally falls to what I would call more industry standards, and that generally is still subjective. So the important points I've highlighted here are the activities that happen um, aligned with the work plan, but the overriding recommendation is whatever the approach, and you can discuss that with your um, solution providers, the best practice would be early in the process to check that out or confirm that with your external auditor because they're the one actually who will be ultimately passing judgment on whether the documentation that you've produced, the way that you've configured the system uh, meets their expectations or meets their expectations of industry standards. Um, the second point is around you need to do this again early in your project. It's not something that you can do after the fact. Uh, and the reason is, is all along the way, you need to provide objective evidence that you have followed a predefined approach 
uh, to how you're going to implement the system. Next up for life sciences companies, similar to SOX, but focused on your primarily on your manufacturing process, there's another uh, host of, of regulations around validating your system in the name of uh, patient um, uh, safety and ultimately how your manufacturing process will is reliable enough to produce the product as intended to, to ensure their safety. So again, uh, key point here, it needs to be planned for in advance. It is also somewhat subjective. Uh, you'll need to work with your favorite subject matter expert, either in-house or externally, uh, and think that through and add that into your work plan. When we talk about organizing your project, as you can see on the board now or on the slide now, um, and we go back to that team analogy, you could say there are a lot of specialized roles uh, on our ERP project. Um, from that knowledge transfer perspective, as a best practice, we typically see kind of a pairing up or a mirroring of the different roles, um, the lighter blue and the darker blue on the slide here. Um, again, driven by the actual scope of the project, but as a best practice, um, good to think about the different roles and who's going to play those different roles um, before the, beforehand. If we break that out, I can come up with a long list of individual roles uh, that could potentially apply, not typically to every project, again, driven by the scope. Uh, but again, important to think through who will play these different roles. Now, I can have multiple people play one role, which does tend to increase the communication overhead to have those multiple people all involved um, doing the same thing. Or I can have one resource play many roles, uh, which is also acceptable. So it's not to say that every uh, project needs to have 42 client individuals involved in it, but there will be potentially 42 different roles that they would need to fulfill. Um, moving on, I would also say, share with you that while there are lots of stories out there about sales folks and consultants and things that they say and do, I will share back to you that we all start with good intentions on every ERP engagement, clients included. So here are some of my favorite quotes uh, prior to ERP projects. And I guess what I'm sharing with you, too, is just the reality is often somewhat different. So again, I'm encouraging everyone as you go into it to understand what assumptions are being made, but be flexible that as you move through your project, the reality is you may not follow everything that was baked into it up front. Along those lines, I wanted to highlight for both clients and, and um, vendors, ERP projects are inherently hard to estimate. And the reasons are really for the, for the bullets I've listed here. Um, on the one hand, I think since vendors do this all the time, there's a, there's a pretty fair uh, expectation of clients that we would know exactly how long it will take to do any given task. Um, by the same token, as somebody who does this all the time, I know very well that there's a huge disparity of how long it takes to do even the same task based on a variety of factors. Given all that, all, all ERP vendors will make assumptions and in, their, in their proposals. The key point for you is you need to understand those assumptions. You need to rationalize those and agree with them on, from your perspective because rest assured, no vendor will be making the same assumption. They could either be very aggressive in their approach or too conservative in their approach. And so to get to that apples to apples type comparison really, really requires you to peel the onion. In the same way, even if the best planned ERP project is inherently difficult to manage, right? I love this cartoon about herding the cats, which I think is, is very applicable. Um, for the, several of the reasons I've already mentioned, uh, be it clients already have day jobs, be it there are many people involved in the project, be it we're all human and we all have different personalities and learning styles and skill sets, it can be a, a, a big challenge to coordinate that many different moving parts on a project. The mitigation strategy for that is really it is essential to allocate an appropriate amount of project management time. I would say to you from the bottom of my heart, that project management on an ERP project is not something that you want to cut. If you're going to over budget anything, this would be the one activity that I think you would want to emphasize. 
Um, for the reasons I've stated here, there is just a whole host of very strong reasons why from both a client and a vendor perspective, you want a strong leader from both organizations who has a view to the priorities and the availability on both sides to work with to resolve the inevitable issues that are going to come up on any project. Next up, from a project resource perspective, you want to take a, a, a good look at you know, what activities do you do well today, what activities do you think you could improve upon, and to what extent uh, you want to insource those based on your current skill sets, and to what extent you want to rely on a third party to help you out. So in this graphic here, that little uh, bar in the center could mo easily move left or right. I would say uh, it's typically not zero or a hundred on either way, but it often from project to project varies greatly um, based on the skill sets of the client, based on what their needs are. So it's definitely one more discussion point uh, to have with your, with your solution uh, provider. In the same way, I would say that your um, project manager is your uh, TREC uh, coordinator, your uh, TREC uh, planner. Um, the solution architect on your project would be your guide and an important role. But likewise, you may need some help doing the heavy lifting. So again, an assessment of what type of resources are most important uh, is also another variable to any project. Next up, in terms of delivery models, of course, today in today's day and age, there are offshore models and there are onshore models. And I think I would make a blanket statement for, again, for the mythical, typical, mid-size project, that because today's ERP projects don't have nearly the amount of new development required, that more often than not, an onshore model seems to be a better fit. Um, certainly the price point for an offshore model is very, very attractive. The availability of resources is attractive. But having been there, having planned these sorts of projects, having done that for a living, there is kind of a, um, a threshold point where I would argue it would be something in the neighborhood of 10 FTEs where it makes sense to offshore an activity. Whereas, as an example, looking back at the uh, seven-month work plan that we looked at, that actual uh, phase of the project where we're doing new development is really you know, somewhere in the eight to 12 week range. And by the time you set up your offshore capability, bring them up to speed, and actually start doing the work, there's not always um, uh, enough time to warrant going down that path. So I'd certainly, I'm a believer in offshore uh, where it makes sense, but it's just not something that you necessarily want to automatically consider. Because again, going back to my previous comments, so much of the project, not just that development piece, so much of the project is face-to-face -face time. It's human interaction that really is best served when it's on site uh, with you uh, in your office. So in that regard, the collaboration, the timing to be able to be flexible to your schedules, the quality that comes out of that interaction, I think more often than not tips the scale to an onshore model. ERP projects always need a change management plan to be successful. They need an executive sponsor to drive it, of course, but they also need things like a burning platform to rally the troops. Um, everyone who's a leader on a project should be ready for that inevitable question, hey, what's in it for me, right? I already have a day job. You're asking me to do more. You know, why should I be part of this, this engagement, right? And there's a variety of answers for that, um, but it's important to anticipate. Um, the other one is, just from a pure change management perspective, experts would say, for us all, um, we all need to be heard to foster buy-in, even if you don't necessarily follow my suggestions. So this speaks to the early phase of the project, what Armenino would refer to as the plan and analyze phase. You want to engage as many stakeholders as possible. Um, of course, not everybody's opinion will be, uh, are, can you be able to incorporate, but just for the opportunity for them to actually voice their concerns, voice their desires, um, they're going to feel better and be much more likely to buy into the solution uh, as time goes on. ERP projects are definitely high stakes. 
They are a major investment. Uh, there's high ROI expect expectations. They're a major purchase. Um, they are high visibility. They are disruptive. Uh, you're going to live with the consequences uh, for years after you go live. Um, by all those account or uh, points, they are high risk and high reward, right? They are um, infrequent. They have legal implications on the SOX and the FDA side. It's the law that you follow these things. Um, they're career impacting, both good and bad, right? Everybody knows that a bad ERP is, uh, engagement is not something you want on your resume. And they're high risk in the sense that um, you're trying to balance all these different activities. For instance, there's no reward for over-documenting your, your system, but there's a severe penalty if you under-document your system. So you're trying to balance all these high-stake activities. The last couple slides in this section are really around um, key success factors and, and, and our risk watch list to look for. Some of these I think I've already touched on a bit, but again, just to belabor it, that teaming approach is absolutely crucial. A united C-suite is very important. Um, you, of course, want a sponsor. A typical sponsor is the CFO from the, from the finance and accounting organization. But if the production organization is not on board, um, I would say truthfully, don't even start your project. You absolutely have to have that united executive support. Again, ERP touches almost every area of the project, so it's, it's critical to, uh, or project of the organization, it's critical to have everyone on board. In terms of a watch list, um, again, expect everyone's coming into this project with, with high expectations, but also the reality that they probably haven't done this very frequently. So in all likelihood, those, those expectations can be easily mismatched. Managing those is, is a very important activity. All right, let's move on and let's get tactical. So that's all great context. I understand more about the rules and the, the planning considerations for ERP projects these days. Now, how do I go do it? First up, I'd repeat that overriding role again is your challenge, your opportunity, your mission is really to optimize those competing demands and variables that we just talked about. There's no one way to do it. Uh, the universal approach these days, be it SOX, be it FDA, be it just good management practice, is then to boil it down to say, let's take a risk-based approach. What are the things that are most important to your, your organization to balance all these competing variables? To execute that, the actual steps we'd, we would uh, recommend are these six, right? First step, and we're going to drill into each one of these in subsequent slides, but um, just to, to walk through it briefly, assess your, you know, before you do anything, just assess your current um, project readiness. Uh, then move into the steps around creating your high-level plan, creating your procurement plan, and documenting your actual solution decision criteria. Again, this may be a bit iterative. If you don't yet have an IT plan, probably a good, good point to create that. It doesn't have to be uh, a huge exercise. It could just be a couple of weeks worth of work or just pulling together uh, the right stakeholders in advance. But to have a, a sense of where you want to go as an organization from an IT perspective, from different dimensions. That's all going to build into step five where you actually are out there talking to the vendors and then ultimately selecting your solution in step six. So as I mentioned, let's, let's dive into each of those. Again, first up, performing that project readiness self-assessment. Here's some, some uh, you know, good questions for everyone to, to ponder. Um, common sense, but very important just to understand where do you need to start? Where's the best place to start from? Next up is creating your high-level approach. And here, you know, I'd say that failing to plan, like the old adage, failing to plan is planning to fail. If you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. That's very applicable here. So again, begin with the end in mind, ponder each of these components, which ones would, would be the most applicable uh, and of need for you all, and then that will become the input into the next step, which is around defining your procurement approach. And again, the probably two different, two different ways to look at this, uh, we'll talk about on the next slide, but the overriding question is really, or the soul searching question is, you know, how complex are your needs? How rigorous a procurement process is really prudent for your organization? 
um, how much work do you want to create for yourself, right? You can go and spend a lot of time doing a very rigorous uh, analysis, or you can do, uh, you know, a more issues-driven approach. And here's where I, I'd summarize that by calling it the bottom-up and the top-down. So the bottom-up would imply a more comprehensive approach, uh, RFP or, you know, uh, checklist of, of the functions and features, and then really following the top-down approach or starting with the top-down approach where I'd characterize that as more of an issues-based or managed by exceptions type approach. And it really depends on, you know, what's worked well for you in the past, how complex is your organization, uh, you know, what, what's, your, um, what's your preference. Um, we're going to talk about it in, in a moment here, but when we get to demoing the software, you know, there's, as I mentioned before, 3,000 different functions and features in, in a leading uh, application. You're going to have to boil that down to what are the most important ones that you want to see? What are the differentiating top 10, if you will? It doesn't have to be 10, of course, but what are those key, key uh, things that you want to see? So when you put all those together, the framework that I would recommend to you is to think about it as four cornerstones. The what, the how, avoid surprises, and then how much, right? And let's, let's dive into these. The first one, the first cornerstone, is around software product fit. And you can see the subcategories that I've, that I've highlighted here around functionality, usability in terms of is, is it easy to navigate, is it intuitive like all the sales uh, you know, messages are around, um, does it have support for the internal controls that you know are going to be needed for, for SOCs or just good business practices? What deployment model are you interested in? And I think also very important is what is the vendor viability? This is definitely the enterprise um, software space is definitely uh, one that is under consolidation pretty much constantly. So uh, something to look at is what is the finances of, of the software provider? What's their track record around R&D investments? Uh, because they may have a great product today, but five years from today to keep pace with the, you know, ever advancing technology on, on all accounts, um, will they have the, the, uh, the resources to do that? Next up is the solution partner approach. And here is, you know, again, the people component. These are the folks that you're going to be working with shoulder to shoulder. Do they understand your requirements? Do they have the resources uh, to actually execute the project? What is their um, implementation approach, which you're going to want to look at their work plan very, very carefully and compare it uh, to other competing solutions? Um, what's their support approach after go live? Um, you have some project timelines in, in mind. Do they have the resources available to meet those? What's their vendor vi um, viability? And as one of my favorite clients in the past I like to say, after you close a deal, what's the icing on the, on the deal, right? What else can they bring to the table that might be extra value add that would be a differentiator? The next cornerstone is around mitigating predictable risks. And so the first step in that is a risk assessment. And there's various categories of risk, which we won't dive into on this, on this session. But everyone has their own stories. Everyone has uh, things that they know have worked well and hot buttons within their organization. And as the new ERP selection lead, you certainly don't want to repeat any of those past mistakes. So uh, definite um, best practice would be to uh, circulate within the organization, uh, poll people for their input on gotchas and things that, that you want to avoid, and then factor those in to your overall plan, right? Uh, as it relates specifically to your software um, decision criteria, you know, what are the things that the software itself can help mitigate, right, in terms of IT controls as, as an example, but then broader than that, you know, the overall project plan, the overall approach to how you're going to source resources, uh, how the contract will be um, structured, whether you'll be beholden to a single vendor and not able to migrate very easily based on the nature of the deployment model. Um, uh, it, would it be more advisable in your organization to use a phased approach or more of a big bang approach in terms of your overall migration strategy? Next up would be around assessing the total cost of ownership. And of course, there's a multitude of, of detailed components into that, be it hard or, or soft component um, uh, areas. 
And when you assess those, and then in the next slide here, optimize those, it may or may not take the, or take the form of a business case. It really depends on how projects are approved within your organization. But the same thought process is still important to think about. Um, it's not just the subscription cost, for example, that you'll be paying for, right? There's, there's more to it than that. Um, that said, as just a data point, uh, on-premise versus cloud, the break-even when you, when you do do a broader business case is usually around three years. So it's something to bear in mind. Um, certainly, from a sales perspective, we like to call on clients after that about that three-year three year period where we know that they've been paying a lot, um, and after three years, they they may have realized that they they would be interested in a different solution because um, they get a little bit of a fee fatigue at that point. But um, that could still be the best solution uh, for you, so it's worthwhile to just think it out um, in advance. On the services side, it's really around trying to create that apples to apples comparison, right? Working with your vendors, understanding their weekly work plans, and that's where you know the devil's in the details. So it's certainly uh, important, again, because I could be making some very aggressive assumptions and make my costs look a lot lower, uh, where my competitor may be obviously making very different assumptions. But in your case, you just want the right solution for you. So it, it pays to definitely scrutinize uh, those, those work plans. All right. So step five is where uh, it all comes together. And so now you, you have the criteria defined. Now you're reaching out to the vendors themselves. And here, again, I, I would advocate kind of a multi-step uh, approach here. Um, step one is really around, um, you know, you're going to reach out um, to vendors initially, do a phone interview, arrange a time for them to come in. Again, I'm, I'm really an advocate of in-person meetings, right? You're going to reach plenty of vendors that are going to say, look, we don't really, you know, they're going to say it this way, but they don't really want to meet with you until you're well qualified. But ideally, you'd want to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. In that first meeting, you're going to talk a little bit about your organization, a little bit about theirs. You're going to share with them your high-level requirements. And I'd say, most importantly, some sample data. And that sample data is what you'd want to see in the next meeting in terms of a demo. It will bring to life um, that product for your organization. And that's, that's meeting number two. You're going to go through your different demos. At the end of those demos, I would encourage you to take all that input and the inevitable conflicting sales messages that you're going to get, compare those, and then give, give the vendors an opportunity to address those. Right? There may be very um, rational reasons as to why they said what they said, but to not necessarily challenge those would be a mistake, right? because I think every vendor would be willing to adjust their approach to best meet your needs, right? but they, they kind of rely on that feedback. The chances of them getting it perfect the first time around uh, is, is not always you know, a high percentage. So that ongoing feedback is helpful. Some subset of the folks you talk to, you'll want proposals from. You'll review those proposals. And again, ultimately, uh, you'll have some feedback. I, again, would encourage you um, provide that feedback to them because they want to do business with you. They, they would want to adjust their plan if they're you know, rational vendors, and I'm sure they probably are. So um, that's an important step. Then review those proposals. And lastly, I would recommend you know, check references. Um, I highlight that just because rather than as a first step, do it as a last step. I can tell you no vendor is going to connect you with a um, reference that doesn't speak highly of their particular uh, product or experience. Right. So the actual value there, everybody still needs to do it. I'm not in any way saying that you shouldn't, but just to kind of be real about what to expect from them. And so. Uh, consequently, doing it at the end, it's more of a, a last validation step more than a, um, uh, a qualification step up front. All right. Step six, actually make your selection, align all the, uh, the four cornerstones of your solution criteria, and uh, begin your project. Great. Okay. In the next five minutes, and then we'll move on to questions, wanted to share with you what to expect from the ERP vendors that you're going to be playing the procurement game with. First off, let's introduce the players, right? Um, the two to introduce, or the two first are really the sales rep and the sales engineer. So a sales rep is a typically a consummate uh, professional. They are well-trained. They are dynamic. They are fun people to meet. They are friendly. Um, and they have one mission in life and that is to sell. Um, they typically have uh, no delivery experience, and for sure they have no delivery 
responsibility in most all organizations. Um, so they, their job is to uh, minimize their business development costs as much as possible. They are commission driven. They are wonderful people, but you just need to understand who you're dealing with. The sales engineer role or the pre-sales engineer role is really the professional demo specialist. Um, depending on who you're doing business with, you may never actually meet these people. Um, they're typically a shared resource amongst several different sales reps. Uh, their job is to demo the product uh, four to five times a day, on the hour, every hour, so to speak. Um, they are very good at what they do. They have done this because of the repetitive nature uh, so many times that they know how to make everything look easy. They know exactly how long to chit-chat in between uh, different um, steps in the process so that the system doesn't look like it's moving slowly. Uh, they know where to navigate to make it look easy. They know the questions you're going to ask before you even ask them. I'd say um, what's key is also just um, don't take them off their script. You'll notice immediately if you take them off their script that they'll want to get back on their script because while everything looks very, very simple, uh, keep in mind everything is exactly scripted. So along with that, are really some typical tactics. And again, these aren't things to uh, demonize sales folks. You know, I'm a salesperson myself, but these are all things that um, we all strive to do, and, and quite frankly, everyone just needs to be aware. So first off, as I mentioned already, we all uh, want to make it look easy, right? Uh, the key point for you is it's probably not as easy as, as you see, or there's probably more than one way to navigate to something um, each time as well. As a salesperson, we're going to keep it relatively high level and cross our fingers that you don't drive us down into a lower level of detail. Again, it's just reality. There's so much um, uh, detail underneath that would have to be explored. But in a sales process, it's actually you know everyone's goal is to keep it at a high level. Another typical uh, example or, or, or tactic would be the 30-day trial. I most definitely recommend you take the 30-day trial. My counsel is simply know what you're getting into in the sense that 30 days passes very, very, very quickly. So before you start the trial, have, have a plan as to who and how you want to evaluate the software because at the end of that 30 days, uh, the vendor most assuredly will, will come to you and say, hey, we've given you the chance to review the software thoroughly. We'd now like you to sign our contract. And the point is you may or may not be ready at that point, so just plan ahead. Another overriding assumption is you are going to adopt my software's way of doing business. And that's an easy way for me to lower my estimate because I'm not um, creating any customizations. I'm not doing anything complex. I'm making the assumption that you, in fact, will embrace whatever my software does. Another good one is really my favorite. You can do that. If you hear that phrase in a demo, just be clear or just be, be uh, follow up and say, who do you mean by you in that sentence? When clients hear you can do that, they think the vendor is saying, yep, the software does it, or the vendor will take responsibility to do that. When a sales rep says that, or a sales engineer, they're saying you, the client, have the opportunity to do that yourself, or you, the client, can make a customization to make it do that. So it's a favorite phrase of, of many sales engineers. Next up, in terms of best practices, here I simply want to say, um, as Captain Barbosa as our inspiration, they are truly more like guidelines than actual rules. Um, everybody wants best practices, but what is the best practice for your organization really depends on your industry, depends on your size, and not every uh, you know, business or best practice is a, is, a, is a best practice for every um, customer. Just like we all, even customers in, this, in, in the same industry segment have very different strategies. The, last, or the next slide is really around deciphering conflicting sales messages. And here, um, I just wanted to touch on a few that are kind of the most popular. Um, the first one I wanted to touch on is upgrades included. And this is really applicable to both uh, on-premise versus um, cloud or SaaS type solutions. And probably more applicable to the cloud or SaaS because that's a common um, benefit is, hey, you don't have to pay for a, an upgrade um, around that. And so I'd just say that that's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, either way, whether it's uh, whichever deployment model it is, once a new upgrade is introduced, you're still going to need to test, possibly uh, you know, integrate, 
again to uh, new versions of software and go through the main point the same motions whether it's cloud or on-premise and in one extreme if you get too many upgrades from a cloud perspective um, that can also be disruptive so uh, depending on the size of your organization you can delay these upgrades but it's it's a bit of a double-edged sword uh, the next one is around just direct versus partner um, go-to-market models right so case in point Armanino is a reseller of Microsoft software. Microsoft goes to market indirect. Uh, we compete with many other um, uh, vendors out there that have a direct sales model, right? I think the dirty little secret underneath that is all software organizations, or I shouldn't say all, but many software organizations aspire to be um, high growth, high technology um, uh, stock opportunities. And to do that, the margins on their software is really what they want to evaluate their company. So at a certain point, they will actually uh, purposely not do any more than X percent of services revenue because the services revenue is a lower margin activity. It's going to drag down their high valuation. So even if there is a uh, vendor that does their own implementations, they'll do so selectively, and they will all uh, leverage third parties for that reason. Lastly, just a quick, couple quick points on white papers. Um, you can read a white paper, you can read, um, and they are very, very compelling for whatever point of view that they are articulating. But more often than not, the actual sponsor of any given white paper, if you read into the fine print, is the company that they're recommending. Wow, surprise, surprise. But um, there's a lot of great information out there in the white papers. I would recommend that, that you read them, but just read them with a grain of salt. All right. Lastly here... Um, so what do you do about all that? Um, peel the onion, I think, is the overriding recommendation here. Um, use that risk-based approach to focus on the most important activities. Um, get it in writing, because you're going to hear a lot of talk, but you, unless it's in writing, you don't really have something to compare it back to. When you're looking at different um, solution providers, you want to scrutinize their work plans. And you really just you know, want to get clear on, on who's going to do what. Right? I, I would argue that the work is the work for any ERP project, almost independent of the actual software itself. Uh, the only assumption or the only uh, debate is really who's going to do the work. Is it going to be the vendor or is it going to be the client? And if it's unclear in the statement of work, then chances are that the assumption is that the client is going to do it. One last one, and I failed to mention it when I was introducing the players earlier, is just the notion that conspicuously absent of, uh, in the list of the players is a representative of the delivery team. So I would highly recommend that when you reach the right point in the sales process, that when you start talking about work plans, that rather than having the salesperson describe the work plan, that you actually request that you meet someone from the delivery team. It may or may not be the actual person delivering your project, depends on all the timing and all those good things. But there certainly will be in a position where they can answer, um, you know, how does it actually get done? What can we expect from the vendor? What, what are you expecting of us all right, in closing, some parting wisdom from our true ERP thought leader, Abe Lincoln, and I'll let you read the quote. But again, the overriding theme is we want you to be an uh, informed ERP buyer. It is definitely worth your time in, of investment. Wrapping up in conclusion, we've talked about the new rules. We've talked about planning your ERP selection um, game plan, and we've talked a little bit about how uh, others play the game. And all good things and important things for you to remember. That said. Great. Well, Tim, thank you. That was very informative. And we do have a couple of questions that have come in. But I'd like to remind the audience, if you open up your webinar pane, you can type in your questions now. And Tim will either answer them while we're on the line or send you an email. So if you have specific questions, please, now is the time to submit those. So, Tim, the first question we got is, how is it that ERP projects now take months and not years to complete? Okay, good question. So I think this goes back to, um, I think I may have mentioned this a little bit earlier, is just this idea that, you know, the traditional ERP engagement of the past, one of the reasons why it was two years long is there was a lot of new development required, be it for system integration or just new functionality that a, that a particular client needed. So to the extent that, ERP projects have matured over the years, and to the extent that folks don't need as many um, new development um, features, then we can dramatically compress the actual amount of time 
that it takes to implement a new solution. And again, what's really left at this point is pretty much just those people-driven tasks where previously we would have had to go up on the mountain, so to speak, and develop that code. Uh, now we're really able to just step-by-step step walk through it. And again, the need to interact with the client, you know, basically every step of the way. Okay, great. The, the next question that came in, it says, of all the ERP projects you've done, what are three major things you see happening, maybe going wrong, and what should we do to avoid those pitfalls in our process? Okay. Um, okay, so one that jumps to mind, I'd say, I, truthfully, any ERP project that has ever gone awry from my personal experience, I could really uh, tie back for sure to the idea that we did not sign off the requirements in a timely fashion. Um, for whatever reason, they we probably had a version of them, but they lingered, and whether it was, you know, uh, the client just didn't get, you know, didn't get to all the right stakeholders, but I would really tie it back to that and the need, therefore, to really have a crisp set of requirements um, and sign those off so both parties really know what, what's been committed and to be able to manage those because, as I said before, uh, a lot of things change um, during a project. So that's, that's important. Um, for a second point, I'd say it's really just maybe similarly it's around um, just mismatched expectations or the need to align expectations. As I think I said earlier in, in, the, in the presentation, you know, this is, this is an activity that people don't do very often, um, you know, from a client perspective. While vendors may do it all the time, clients do it once every five years. So it's really inevitable that people would, you know, reasonably have ex expectations that wouldn't necessarily align with what the vendor's thinking. So I think a concerted effort to really focus on aligning expectations, uh, understanding the work plan, uh, what's expected of each party is, I think, a very uh, important point. Um, as a third point, I would say it kind of ties back to then maybe around um, project management, right? I think the other reason that projects may not have gone well in the past would be when you, when you tie back to it, given that volume of change that happens uh, in every project and then the need to manage that proactively, to anticipate issues, to resolve issues that, that come up, um, having both a strong client project manager, uh, be it someone like the controller very commonly on the client side or an IT lead, um, and then on the, on the vendor side, just having a, a strong leader that, you know, really has a view to the competing resource, um, you know, needs and has the influence and the authority to actually reprioritize, um, I think, resources on both sides, both client and vendor, is very key to be able to address the issues that come up during, during the projects. Okay, another question here. Can you talk about the risks and trade-offs of a big bang versus a phased approach for ERP implementations? How do I know which approach is right for me and my company? Okay, another good question. So um, I would say that I, I, again, depends on the scope that's involved, right? Sometimes it kind of, if you're just thinking about replacing your finance system, it's kind of a given that it would be a big bang. But I would say that many times um, it's quite common that people would, would uh, implement both um, finance and supply chain and manufacturing all at once, and I'd say that's, a, you know, in, term that, in terms of a big bang, versus uh, phasing that out to say something like finance and accounting first and maybe supply chain and then manufacturing as a second step. That's also a very common approach. And then HR would typically be its own phase or CRM could be its own phase in, in the interim. I think for a big bang approach, uh, the pros would be, you know, more or less you, you've, you've gotten – the machine, if you will, uh, revved up and everybody's marching. So the more you can get done, you know, all together and, and get that done, um, I think the overall, it would have a lower cost. Um, but from a budget perspective, that would be a lot of spend, presumably, in, in a single budget cycle. Um, on, the, on the phase side, I'd say the pros is that it would, the pro would be that it would reduce your risk. Obviously, you're not implementing as much functionality all at once. Um, but the con would be would tend to have a higher cost because you have a longer runtime, and uh, maybe the benefit then is you 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 would be able to spread that cost over presumably more than one budget cycle, as an example. So that would be it. All 
All right, we're going to squeeze in one more question here at the end. So um, this person wrote that their company is pursuing an IPO, but they haven't determined the timeline. Uh, what considerations should be made in assessing an ERP implementation, given that we may go public shortly after implementation? OK, very good. So here, I think you want to anticipate um, that you will need to be SOX compliant, of course. So I think the, the council would still be uh, to engage a, um, you know, a SOX SME such as Armanino, uh, but to, you're going to need to go through that planning process where you're going to need uh, to define your policies and procedures, you're going to need to define your IT controls, you're going to want your, your ERP system to help enable those IT controls, and you're going to have to document um, all of that and provide objective evidence along the way. So the short answer is just definitely include SOX readiness as part of your ERP engagement um, would be my counsel. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Tim. And I, as you can see on the screen, we've got our contact information for Tom Mescal, our ERP uh, partner lead. So if you have any questions regarding Armino McKenna or ERP selection, please reach out to Tom. And as you leave the webinar, we will you will receive an exit survey. And we really appreciate it if you could fill that out. It helps us improve our webinar presentations for the future. And it also offers you the opportunity to sign up for a copy of Tim's ebook on ERP selection. So thank you very much for joining us. Your feedback is important to us. And uh, thanks for being here today.